My name is Gigi Stortz, and I'm representing the Lambda Lunch Interest Group, which is hosting today's WALL speaker. It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Lalita Ramakrishnan. Dr. Ramakrishnan received her medical degree from India in 1983 and her PhD um, at Tufts University. She did medical residency at Tufts again in Boston, an infectious diseases fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and then a postdoctoral fellowship um, with Stan Falco at Stanford University. Uh, she then joined the faculty of the University of Washington in Seattle, but recently moved to the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Ramakrishnan has carried out seminal work on the pathogenesis of tuberculosis and an extremely important but understudied disease. According to the WHO, 1.5 million people die of tuber died of tuberculosis in 2013. And I found it interesting that it's among the top five causes of death for women um, between ages 15 and 44. Also, more than 30% of the world's population has latent TB, so a third of, this, of the people in this room carry TB, latent TB. So Dr. Ramakrishnan is addressing questions such as why do people differ in their susceptibility or resistance to TB, and why do those who do not contract TB vary in the severity of the illness? Now, to address these questions, her group has developed zebrafish as a model. And zebrafish are naturally susceptible to tuberculosis caused by Mycobacterium marinum, which is a close relative of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, the t fish are a great system because they're transparent, so you can monitor the infection process, and you have the advantage of being able to um, have both host and um, bacterial mutants. So as we will hear today, the research is shedding light on TB pathogenesis as well as fundamental mechanisms of immune cell chemotaxis, adhesion, aggregation, and immune regulation. So, and findings from the Ramakrishnan group made in zebrafish have been borne out in human populations and are informing new strategies for intervention. As you might expect, Dr. Ramakrishnan has received numerous awards, including the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. And this year, she was uh, elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so that, as is shown here, the title of today's talk is The Zebrafish Guide to Tuberculosis. We're looking forward to hearing all about um, this great model system. Um, well, thank you. This is uh, really a great honor, probably uh, the most honorable lecture that I'm about to give. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly sort of thrilled that uh, Gigi's my host because uh, I've known, I mean, Gigi's been famous for a very long time. And uh, I remember when she came to give a seminar at the University of Washington when I had just become, just joined the faculty and I had kind of wanted to talk to her but I didn't dare put myself on, my, on her list because I didn't think I had anything interesting or important to say to her. And uh, it's just great that, uh, that not only did she invite me, but, but I found at breakfast that we, I actually did have something to say to her. And, uh, and, and we might, I'm hoping to even recruit her as a collaborator in some stuff. So thank you, and we'll get started. So uh, Geeky gave a great introduction to my talk. and. You, she's, she pointed out to you how TB is still widespread. And the important thing to note is that it is widespread and has, is killing more people today than it's ever killed before, be, despite the fact that we've had effective chemotherapy for it since the 1960s. 
And the regime that was developed in the 1960s is still being used today to treat TB. And not only is it prevalent, but we now have a burgeoning epidemic of drug-resistant TB. And you can see that it's quite widespread. And I like to say that it's turning Russia red again. But, but joking apart, this is, this is a, a, a really serious problem because drug-resistant TB, particularly extensively drug-resistant TB, um, makes TB once again the lethal disease that it was in the pre-antibiotic era. So in the face of failing drugs and, and an ineffective vaccine, um, it doesn't take a lot of brain to realize that one might have to um, fall back on having to look at the basic biology of the pathogen and the host, as in other, in other words, the pathogenesis of the disease, to see if it might teach us some, um, some, aspect, some things about TB. And this is what a number of labs has started to do over the, of, over the last couple of decades. So to introduce you to the life cycle of TB, as it were, TB is transmitted by a bacterium. And from the, in, from the lung of an in, infected individual who has to cough it up, and it's transmitted in small aerosols to the unfortunate person near them. And then it's, it gets into macrophages, which are, the, which are primary defense cells of the immune system that are meant to tackle pathogens and kill them, but TB has learned how to uh, survive in these. And indeed, it, the, it somehow then gets inside the body. So unlike other pneumonias, it's not a pneumonia on the surface of the lung, but one that penetrates the epithelium and enters the lymphoid tissue of the lung and causes disease there, and from there in, in many other organs of the body, as I'll show you in a little bit. The classic, the quintessential structure that these, macro, these infected macrophages that reach the deep recesses, the deep, deep areas of the lung form, is called the granuloma, or the tubercle for which the disease is named. And the bacteria somehow survive in these structures and at some point, these structures break open by the death of the infected cells. The bacteria are released. And it is these released bacteria from the necrotic structure that can then transmit. And, and so we in the lab have been able to take a look at all of these, these various phases uh, by studying infection using the surrogate model that Gigi referred to, and that is Mycobacterium marinum. Now, Mycobacterium marinum is a closed genetic relative of the human pathogen, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's actually well known to clinicians, infectious disease clinicians, and particularly dermatologists, because it causes a tuberculosis-like disease that's restricted to the skin and the soft tissues, the, the, the superficial tissues of the extremities. And um, but, the, but the thing that's important to remember is that it doesn't just infect the hands of postdocs, it also infects fish. And this was first realized in 1926 when fish in the Philadelphia Aquarium, that's now defunct, were dying of a tuberculosis-like disease. So these fish were wasting, and when they did autopsies on the fish, they found that they had tubercles and they found them all over in the gills, the spleen, the kidneys, and so on. And yes, fish don't have lungs. And um, these, it, it was not clear why these fish were dying. These were the fish, in fact, the kinds of fish that were dying, because they couldn't actually culture anything. But when they did special st stains, this guy called Aronson, they found that they had, the tubercles were full of acid, of bacteria that looked just like mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so that's when he had this brain wave that since fish are cold-blooded, he might try culturing the tissues at low temperatures. And when he did that, bingo, he was able to culture the pathogen. And since then, 
um, 16S ribosomal sequencing has shown that it's the closest genetic relative of the human pathogen. And this has now been confirmed by sequencing at the Sanger Center, showing that indeed this pathogen is probably represents the branch point in the evolution to pathogenicity of the mycobacterium genus. And it is indeed the closest relative of, of the TB bug that infects humans. Now, um, when I was, um, it's just sort of a good lesson for particularly the younger people. It's, it's always, it might be good to, most of my, my breakthroughs have been because I've listened to some idea, some clever idea that somebody's given me. And um, when I started to first work with Mycobacterium marinum, or when I decided that I was going to work with Mycobacterium marinum, and this was when I started, when I was about to join Stan Falco's lab, I was talking about this to my, uh, my infectious diseases attending, Don Payan at UCSF. And I remember I was sitting, he, you know, he had a lovely house with a swimming pool, and I was sitting in one evening or with my husband at, and, at, you know, by his swimming pool, and I told, he said, well, what are you gonna do next year? And I said, well, I'm going to, I've thought of this idea, and I'm gonna stand, and I have, and we're gonna work on the surrogate pathogen. And he said, oh, you should explore this in the zebrafish so you can get the host site. And of course, I had no idea what he meant, but I was too embarrassed to say anything. So I went home and I looked it up. And, and then years later, I, when I got my own job, I decided to, to think about what he had said and to explore this in the zebrafish. So first of all, we had to show that the zebrafish did in fact have disease that looked very much like human disease. So here is a human granuloma in, real, in, in, in a real H&E section as opposed to a cartoon. And what you'll see here in a stain that only stains the host and not the bug is that you see a very well organized structure and you see cells but you also see this acellular area, no nuclei, and that's that necrotic area that I showed you. And if you look at the fish equivalent of this, which I did, you can see that now when I stain it with a bacterial stain, that you see that nice, that same well-circumscribed structure. There's some bacteria in the cellular areas because they can, they can certainly grow in the cells to some extent, but you can see that the acellular area is chock full of bacteria because they can grow even better in the necrotic debris, and we're going to get to that. But the wonderful thing about the zebrafish, again, something that Gigi mentioned, is that it has a transparent phase. It, for the first two or three weeks of its life, it's transparent. And so you can do all kinds of wonderful things in it. And the developmental biologists like it because they can study developmental processes in real time in live animals. And so we thought, well, maybe we can look at uh, developmental processes in real time in live animals too. Uh, I mean, at infection processes. And so we did, and here in a fish that is engineered to have green fluorescent macrophages and red fluorescent neutrophils that we've infected with bacteria that we've engineered to have blue fluorescent, report, uh, blue fluorescent constitutive reporter, we can show that those nice tight granulomas form, and like human granulomas, they're made mostly of macrophages with a few neutrophils wandering in and out, and we can see that some of these are infected just as they are in human macrophages, in human granulomas. But, oh, but I make the fish look very big, and in fact, it's very small. So from a technical perspective, it's important to remember that the fish is small, and my, uh, my technician, Kevin, who developed a lot of these procedures in my lab, wants you to see that it's really small enough to fit on the cravat of Lincoln on the penny. And there, that's Kevin. And so I'm going to just show you how Kevin injects these bacteria into the fish. So you can soak the fish with the bacteria and you, they will get infected, but if you want to monitor infection in real time, you want to know when it happened and so we infect them. Now one place to infect them is the hindbrain ventricle cavity, which is a cavity that is lined with epithelium and doesn't have any phagocytes in it to begin with, but where you can see cell recruitment happen. So you can, you can sort of monitor that very first phase of infection. And so to do this, Kevin uses 
a, a suction device, and he has a little bit of vacuum there that he uses to hold the fish. He's got a fine glass needle that he pulls, and he's got bacteria mixed with phenol red, so he can see the dye go in, and you can watch that. And so he releases the vacuum. Now, if you want to bypass that first step, because when you want to probe the infection, you want to do it in multiple ways, then you can put the bacteria directly into the bloodstream, as he's doing here, injecting into the caudal vein, and here he uses a different approach, a sort of a hockey stick to hold the fish, and he can get it done that way. People in the lab are good enough at this that they can do 100 of these uh, an hour and keep it sustained for several hours, six, seven hours at a time, so you can start to do genetic screens in them. The other thing that we've developed is so a lot of little things we've done that make this model um, quite uh, profitable. So I thought I'd share them with you. Because of the large yolk, the, 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 it can feed off its yolk for at least 14 days. And so you don't actually need to feed them. So you can do husbandry in these 96 well plates, and others actually here at the NIH even do them in 384 well plates, but we use 96 well plates. And then you can, um, these, these fish, they swim around, so you have to in, immobilize them for mi microscopy. So what Kevin realized he could do was to simply plunk, he does um, thermal anesthesia, so he simply plunks the plate on, a, on an ice bucket, and in 10 minutes the fish stop moving, and then he puts them on a stage that moves, you know, so, so and he can take images of, the, of all the fish within 10 minutes, and that's about the time that the fish stay asleep. So you can keep doing this all day long and it doesn't bother the fish and you can do it for many, many days so that you can study infection sequentially in the fish. And that's how on low magnification an infected fish would look. Here's red fluorescent bacteria. And then I had an undergraduate in the lab who wrote some code and showed that she could quantify infection and confirm that it correlated well with actual bacterial plate counts. So, but now, if you want to, you can do that, and you can do a lot of that, but you can also study infection in great depth. And here I'm using old-fashioned differential interference contrast microscopy, that is phase contrast microscopy. So here we've in, we're going to inject bacteria here, and you can see here's a bacterium. Within an hour, cells have arrived. These are macrophages. And these macrophages, you're going to, wa you're going to watch this macrophage eat this bacterium. Okay, so we've got an infected macrophage sitting at the surface, and what you're going to see now, uh, several days later, you're going to see, that's, we've left behind the brain, the cavity there, and you're going to see an infected macrophage carrying bacteria in, and you can see there are plenty of bacteria in there that's doing, they're doing pretty well. Now it turns out that these are not the same macrophages. In fact, they're complete, not only, they're not even the same kind, type of macrophage. And this has all come to light only in the last few months from my, this was my first graduate student who showed all this. And um, the next, the, the, the person who's identified exactly, just, just de determined exactly what's going on is my most recent graduate, C.J. Cambier. So C.J. decided to tackle this question of What's, the, what's happening in that very first phase? And so, he, what he did was to say, if I put just garden variety bacteria into the hindbrain ventricle, what do I see? And he showed that he could see macrophages coming to pick up these bacteria. And as predicted, he could show that this, rec the recognition of these bacteria was mediated by toll-like receptors because if you knocked out the adapter for toll-like receptors, you no longer got macrophages coming to standard gram-positive or gram-negative commensal pathogens. But when he looked at mycobacterium, this was different because he could see macrophages coming, but there was absolutely no dependence on toll-like receptors. Now, this was very odd because 
not, not only like do mycobacteria have toll-like receptors, in fact, somebody's Joel Ernst has estimated that they have 99 of them. I'm not quite sure how he got that number. But not only that, but the discovery of toll-like receptors was really facilitated by the fact that Charlie Janeway just realized that, ad, that to, to be an effective vaccine or to mount an effective immunity, you needed an adjuvant. And adjuvants, the best adjuvant known is BCG, which is, or, or PPD, which is nothing but uh, killed mycobacterial um, cells. And so if, if there are all these um, bacterial PAMPs present, then why aren't they recognized uh, by the body? What's going on? And here CJ had a clue because he used a non-pathogenic ancestor, a soil-dwelling ancestor of Mycobacterium marinum, of the pathogens, and he showed that this now was recognized by toll-like receptors. So something had changed during the evolution of pathogenicity that made the pathogen no longer recognized by toll-like receptors. And what he realized was happening was that there was a lipid, um, a, a, li a fatty coat that called PDIM, that masks the PAMPs. And he did a number of experiments to show that in fact it's just a physical masking of the PAMP. So the, the, the pathogens have these PAMPs that mask them, whereas the non-pathogenic mycobacteria as well as all of your garden variety bacteria don't have these PAMPs. And in the case of, and, and, and there's a great significance to having this coat because it turns out that if you, ma if you don't have the PAMP, a masking lipid, and you signal through toll-like receptors, you're bringing in, you're somehow ending up in a macrophage that kills you because the macrophage is able to make inducible nitric oxide synthase. So here, the, the, what we're seeing here are not the bugs, but this is simply a um, green fluorescent macrophages with an antibody for INOS. So these are INOS producing macrophages. And on the other hand, if you have the masking lipid, then you don't make the INOS. And, and we also showed that the INOS is what kills the bacteria, okay? So now the question is, well, how do, okay, great. They've got a masking lipid that prevents the bad macrophages from coming and killing them, getting, uh, eating them and killing them, but then, they, we already showed you they are getting in, so how are they getting in? And it turns out that the PDIM has a partner, and that is a phenolic glycolipid. It's kind of a sidearm, and phenolic glycolipid is somehow recruiting those permissive macrophages to come in, and CJ showed this as well. So up till now, the story looks like this. If you're not pathogenic, then you recruit via toll-like receptors, and you bring in these bad macrophages and mycobacteria get killed. But the pathogenic ones have these masking lipids and then they have a recruiting lipid and this is somehow bringing in permissive macrophages. And he showed that this was through a host, specific host chemokine, CCL2, and its cognate receptor, CCR2, that this was happening. Okay, so, but there's a, but this then led us to a conundrum because it turns out that TB, unlike most, most infections are, the, mo the, the bigger the inoculum, the greater your chance of getting infected. But TB is a paradox, because TB can only infect you in the bottom of the lung, in, these, in, the, alveolar cavity, in the alveolar spaces. And so because of that, it can only be transmitted by small droplets that contain only one to three bacteria. And I've been teaching this to medical students for years and years using this very cartoon that look, you know, you gotta go way down in there in, in order to infect. And of course, I haven't known why, and sometimes doctors don't worry about why. And this has been shown not only very nicely in epidemiological studies, the best one actually being done in, um, in, a, sh in a naval ship here off the coast of Baltimore, USS um, Constitution, where they, were able to track who got infected and who didn't and showed that only people connected by very fine ductwork were infected by, uh, by people who have case, cases of TB. But it's also been shown in animal studies where 
um, wells working at Hopkins infected rabbits with either big droplets of 10,000 bacteria that he could show by transection got stuck in the trachea versus tiny droplets of one to three bacteria which he could show landed deep inside. And as you can see very nicely here, only the, the rabbits who got few bacteria got infected. So you had to go to the bottom of the lung. And this made us come up with a model. And we thought that this might be because if we have the bi bi mycobacteria have a strategy to avoid detection in the upper airways, but the upper airways are replete with other bacteria, pesky bacteria that all express PAMPs. So if they're expressing PAMPs and bringing in the wrong macrophage, then uh, mycobacteria might be cross, caught in the crossfire and essentially be uh, gobbled up by these macrophages. And so the way we tested that was simply by taking mycobacteria and co-infecting the, them with a PAMP-expressing bacteria, and then looking at the progression of just the mycobacterium. So here we have mycobacterium that we've either infected alone or co-infected with Pseudomonas, and we're looking at how many mycobacteria we have. And if it's alone, then you can see in three days you're getting quite a bit of growth, but you can see that if you've got a co-infecting bacterium, then you don't see any growth. And indeed, we showed that this was dependent. This, this um, inhibition by the PAMP-expressing bacteria was dependent on host having MyD88 and the host having INOS. So we now um, come to the third part of this evolutionary strategy of mycobacterium. It not only has to have the masking lipid and the, the uh, uh, recruiting lipid, but that only works if, these are, if there's a small droplet size. And so it, the strategy doesn't work in the upper airway, but in the lower airway where there are far fewer commensals, then you, you can, your strategy of bringing in the right macrophage can work. And so you can think of it as um, the microbiome is, is protecting us because the fact that TB has to go in in small droplets makes it far less infectious than uh, your upper, your things like common colds and measles and so on. On the other hand, you can think of it as TB's survival strategy that despite this, it's managed to do pretty well because it's been around for 70,000 years and it's seen a lot of changes in human uh, behavior, it's, it's gone, it's seen its way through the Neolithic demographic transformation and, and still managed to survive. So it's a good example of co-evolution of pathogen and host. But I want to just, normally I would end this part here, but, but CJ has just got some very beautiful results that I think are worth sharing with you to kind of complete the story. Because at, at the end of that, that work, which was published in Nature, CJ's committee told him, well, you know, you've had another, you've had, he had two papers, the second of which was a Nature paper, and they said, well, why don't you just graduate? And CJ was quite happy with that, I don't know why, but he liked that idea a lot. But then he got a result that made him stay um, another seven or eight months, and the result was this. So he had envisioned that the way the recruiting lipid worked to make the host make CCL2 was to induce CCL2 production in the epithelium because the bacterium first encounters the epithelium. And this made a lot of sense because epithelium makes CCL2. And so that was his model. But when he did, he did an experiment. And the experiment was that he knocked out macrophages in the fish. And he fully expected that the CCL2 production would remain intact in response to the mycobacterium, the initial infection. And in fact, he, f he found that it dropped. He could get no CCL2 if there were no macrophages. So what's going on? The CCL2 is required to recruit macrophages, and yet macrophages are required to make CCL2. And so this was the paradox that, C that CJ stayed on to have a look at. And what he realized right away was that, yes, while CCL2 was required to recruit macrophages, if you looked, compared it to just mock infection, there was still some macrophage recruitment in the absence of CCL2. So this meant that there was some subpopulation of macrophages that was coming in in the absence of CCL2. And so here he used a clever trick 
And the trick is that even at this young age, these fish have a blood-brain barrier. And this might make particularly make sense for a creature that's free swimming in the waters of the Ganges at the tender age of three. It better have some good mechanisms in place. And so the, it has a blood-brain barrier. So if you inject Herx dye, which is just a nuclear dye that stains everything, into the caudal vein, as I showed you, and now you, you'd make your infection in the hindbrain ventricle, the, this dye can't get into the hindbrain ventricle. The only way it'll get in there is if macrophages from the circulation bring it in. And so when he looked at infection now, he could see that some macrophages didn't have the dye and others did. And it turned out that these guys that didn't have the dye were brain resident macrophages. So just like the lung, the brain has resident macrophages. They're called microglia. And so he, he saw a combination of peripherally recruited circulating monocytes and macrophages. And what he found was that he, f in the, he could see that the, the, the brain, the resident macrophages get recruited before the circulating ones. And he could show that this first recruitment was not dependent on the, CC, on the CCL2. So they were a default recruitment. But the second one was. So the model would be that the bacteria get into the first resident macrophages that are recruited in a default way to all pathogens. And he showed this to be the case. And then somehow, those are making the CCL2 to recruit the next round. And he was able to show this by using a, a, a mutant in the fish that doesn't have the brain resident macrophages, because now he was able to show that the recruitment of the second um, circulating macrophages went away completely. So the brain resident macrophages were required to recruit that next round. And in fact, what he showed was that the bugs get in to the default, to the, recruit, to the resident macrophages that are recruited in a default fashion. And this is a ubiquitous recruitment to all bacteria. The mycobacterium doesn't know what to do about it, so it has to get into them. And it's now reprogramming these cells to make CCL2. The very cells that come to it are making the CCL2. It's recruiting a new cell, and the, ce and the bacteria are transferring into that. And so you can see here, this is an infected cell that's a resident macrophage because there's no blue in it. And you'll see these back, it, you're going to see it fuse to a new cell that's just coming in. And these are all done in sequential imaging that lasts, um, oh, 20, 30 hours. So there it is. There's the blue guy. And you can see that they come and they fuse. And if that doesn't happen, and you can see that all the transfer events happen within the first, um, between two days and about five days of infection. And they're completely dependent on the bacterium having the phenolic glycolipid. Because if they don't have it, then you don't see any transfer events until very late. And the consequence of that is seen in the next slide. Because what you'll see is that the resident macrophage is very well capable of killing the bacteria. And here's a bacterium that's in the process of being killed by the cell over several hours. Boom, it's gone. And so what's happening here is that the bug is, finds itself in a resident macrophage. If it doesn't have the phenolic glycolipid, then it's slowly killed by the resident macrophage. And if it does have the phenolic glycolipid, it is starting to be killed, but it's reprogramming the cell to make CCL2. That's bringing in the new cell, and it's able to transfer. So whether an individual gets infected or not, and that's that one third of the human race that Gigi was talking about, really depends on whether who wins, whether the resident macrophage is able to kill it before it manages to escape. So that's the first bit. How does TB begin? 
And so I think I've told, I hope I've told you a little bit about this. So now let's look, let's look at this next phase and see what we've learned from the fish about this phase. And so let's go back to looking at what we first saw before we started to delve into it. So that next stage after the macrophage goes in, you can already see these granulomas forming, as I already showed you before with fluorescence microscopy, but I'm going to show it to you here. And what you're going to see is an uninfected macrophage come and join this granuloma, showing you that it's a highly chemotactic structure. It's actually recruiting macrophages to come to it. So here's our new macrophage. It's coming in, and you're going to see it's kind of squeeze its way in here. Okay, and then this is the kind of time-lapse movie that made us question an, a very old dogma in the field, and that was that the tuberculous granuloma is a critically important host protective structure that walls off the bacteria, though that's the language of medical textbooks and immunology textbooks, and restricts their growth. And what we found was that it was a highly dynamic structure, and what was happening was that bacteria would fill up a macrophage because they would be able to grow in it, and then they would kill the macrophage by apoptosis. And this is that baseline um, cell death pathway that's operant in the early granuloma. So this macrophage is dying so that the bacteria is still in, in, within it, and a new macrophage comes and engulfs this macrophage so that the bacteria transfer from one cell to another. Now this is distinct from that first event I showed you where there's transfer from a live bacterium to a dead one, uh, to a new one. Here a dead cell is giving up its bacteria to a new cell. And that you can sort of see why macrophages are called macrophages or big eaters. I mean, it's really, Kind of maybe I should we should go into obesity research or something here. So we've got a new infected macrophage, but in reality, so you're going to say, well, okay, you know, these these transferred from one to the other. Why would the granuloma be a bacterium expanding structure, which you have just told me it is? Well, it's because in reality, most of the time, a single dead macrophage that's packed up is eaten by two to three new macrophages so that the contents are distributed and now they can grow again. So they, can, they use the macrophages to expand themselves intracellularly. And this, is, um, this strategy um, is dependent on a very famous virulence system in TB that is a, a secretion system that has a particular effector called ESAT6 and ESAT6 is secreted by the secretion system. And um, Dana, Hannah, and Muse in the lab were able to show that this expansion, rec that recruitment of cells and expansion into them was dependent on this, on this ESAT6 structure. So here, using fluorescence microscopy, they can show you how in the wild type, very rapidly new macrophages are being brought in and are being infected, because only infected macrophages are showing up on this. In contrast, if you have an ESAT6 mutant, it's perfectly well able to grow within the macrophage. That is not the problem, and I'm going to show you that problem next. But, in, but instead, but, what's the, but the problem is that it's not able to recruit new macrophages, even though it really, really fills up. And, uh, the mechanism of this became apparent when Tam Pozos joined as a postdoc in the lab. She was a pediatric infectious diseases doctor. And what she did was to do a microarray screen, that was in the good old days, and she was able to ask what host partner is induced only when the ESAT6 determinant is present. So using wild type bacteria versus ESAT6 mutant bacteria and comparing the difference in host gene expression, she came up with MMP9. And people always complain, say, you know, you should, you know, it's the problem with doing screens, these kinds of arrays and, and RNA-seq is you get too many um, 
too many candidates, and I have a good trick for you, which is to try to do it badly, because then you only get one. And in fact, we literally only got two genes, MMP9 and its regulator, a TIMP, TIMP2. So, so we saw MMP9 differentially induced, but the trick, but the, but the proof of the pudding is in does it matter? And the way to test that is you knock out MMP9, and you now ask, if I put wild-type bacteria into an MMP9 mutant, am I going to get an attenuated infection just as I do with the ESAT6 mutant? So here we have the whole fish showing the ESAT6 mutant. It has all different names. This is, this is part of the problem. And so here's wild-type, here's the ESAT6 mutant in wild-type, all in wild-type fish. And now look at the MMP9 um, system. So here are now wild-type bacteria in wild-type fish versus MMP9 mutant. And you can see how it reproduces that. And so this part tells you that what's happening is that once the bug gets in, now remember, we've already shown you that it moved from the nasty, bad macrophages into a permissive macrophage. And so now it wants to recruit more of these because it, it's happy to stay in these. And so what it's doing is to use, it switched from using its lipids to using the secreted protein that's now inducing um, the production of MMP9. And what we've shown is that it's using the epithelium. The epithelium that we couldn't find in the first step is now coming into play, and it's using the lung epithelium to, or in the fish, some other epithelium, to recruit, to induce the MMP9 to bring permissive macrophages that it can then transfer into. Okay, so. There was, so I, at this point, we found ourselves inadvertently getting into a very big question in TB, which is the question of why does it take so long to treat TB? And as I told you, there have been perfectly effective drugs for TB for, since the 1960s, and yet there's a lot of TB. And I didn't tell you why, because I was saving it till now. And the reason for that, everyone agrees, is because treatment takes too long. It takes six months to nine months to treat drug-sensitive TB with three to four drugs. And this is really not feasible, wouldn't be feasible here, let alone in economically underprivileged areas where your livelihood depends on you're not going to a clinic to get drugs. So the question has been why? Why is it that it takes so long? Because if you put TB into, uh, you know, in a lab culture, 99% are killed within 24 hours, just like any rapidly growing bug. So it isn't slow growth that's the problem in culture. So the model has been that in vivo, as a corollary to the protective granuloma model that we don't think is quite right anymore, has been that the bugs get into this and they essentially are put to sleep. They become dormant and they, um, and bacteria that are in stationary phase, as we all know, any bacterium is not sensitive to antibiotics because antibiotics target things that are, um, that are really essential for growing bacteria, not non-growing bacteria, such as cell wall and ribosomes and RNA polymerase and everything. And so that has been the model that you've got to have, uh, that, that there are these non-growing, non-replicating bacteria that cause drug tolerance. But sort of by starting with the zebrafish and getting further, what we discovered was that in fact, and I'm going to tell you the, the, the punchline first, is that what's happening is that when bacteria enter macrophages, they now turn on efflux pumps, bacterial efflux pumps, of which they have many and of which we've identified a few. And these bacterial efflux pumps allow the bacteria to grow in the macrophage. Remember how I told you that ESAT6 was needed to bring in new macrophages but wasn't required to grow in the macrophage? Well, these efflux pumps are required for the bacteria to grow in the macrophage. And, but these efflux pumps also induce drug tolerance. So these bacteria, that the, a sort of side effect of them is that they are pumping out the antibiotics we use. 
And so as a result of that, you have bacteria that are the most rapidly growing because they're able to tolerate the, e because they're able to actually grow in the macrophage because they have efflux pumps that are also the most tolerant. So kind of turning the old model topsy-turvy. And so Kristen then identified that if you used efflux pump inhibitors, it was a double whammy because it would prevent the bugs from growing and act as an in vivo acting antimicrobial, but it would also um, prevent the rifampicin, in this case, from being pumped out. And so Kristen made the initial discovery as a graduate student in the lab, and then she was joined by John, uh, um, an infectious diseases fellow who's taken this work all the way to a clinical trial. Uh, and Kevin Takaki, who did much of the work that initially started in the fish. So the work started in the fish because people asked us, well, what happens with antibiotics in the fish? And when we use classic TB drugs in the fish, we could show that indeed they kill the bacteria, but not all of them. We saw the same phenomenon of drug tolerance. The bacteria were always in macrophages, and they were never drug resistant. If you cultured them outside the fish, they were completely susceptible. So it was just a, the classic mechanism, the classic phenomenon of tolerance, which was induced by the environment. And she showed, so Kristen now showed very nicely that this was induced by macrophage growth. If you put the bugs in human macrophages, in vitro, in culture, initially they're killed very nicely, but if they've lived in the macrophage for a bit, then they're not killed very nicely at all. So this is tolerance, and again, I emphasize this is not resistance. And the way we found out that this was the most rapidly growing bacteria was to use a, a plasmid that segregates faithfully with replication. And so if the old model was correct, then you would predict that the bacteria that had lost the plasmid, that had retained the plasmid because they hadn't replicated, would be the ones enriched for the tolerant population. But in fact, we found just the opposite. It was the bacteria that had lost the plasmid that were the most enriched for drug tolerance. And this then told us that we might be um, really thinking about a different mechanism. And this is how we then figured out that this was mediated by efflux pumps. And in this particular case, we identified an efflux pump that mediates tolerance to one of the frontline drugs, rifampicin. And you can see that if we, this is wild type, and you can see that after growth in a macrophage, it's become tolerant. But if you knock out the pump, then tolerance goes away. And not only that, but even in the absence of antibiotics, as I already told you in the model, this pump is responsible for intracellular growth. Wild type grows in the macrophage in the 96 hours, and the mutant doesn't grow. And uh, so then we looked at the efflux pump literature and identified that a very old, well-tolerated drug, verapamil, can be used, uh, might be a good candidate to try to reduce tolerance, and indeed we were able to show that it reduced the tolerance not only of rifampicin, but also of isoniazid, which is the other frontline drug. So we were able to use one drug to reduce tolerance of two agents, and as predicted, in vivo, even without drugs, without antibiotics, verapamil should reduce the growth of the bacterium, right? Because the pump is being used to promote growth of the bacterium even in the absence of antibiotics. And indeed, verapamil does just that. It magically converts into being an antimicrobial in vivo. And so it is that predicted double whammy. So based on this, there's now, so we actually got a colleague of ours, Bill Bishai, to, to test this in mice to see if a verapamil would, in, would reduce a relapse of short-term treatment in, in a mouse model of TB, and he was able to show very nicely that it did. And based on that, uh, we were able to get a trial funded, which is being done uh, at the TB Research Center in India, which is where initially all the, the drug treatment, the, the drug treatment protocols that we use today were actually developed there by Denny Mechison. And that's the same place that is now testing whether verapamil 
can be used as a treatment shortening agent. And it's to it, our great good luck that verapamil actually concentrates in the lung. So we may be in good shape um, for, for this trial. And so this is something that's just begun. Okay, so in the last bit, I want to tell you, so I've, I've walked you through how TB cheats the immune system to enter. I've shown you how it now yet again tricks the immune system to form a granuloma from which it can spread, in which it can spread from cell to cell. I've shown you how it uses efflux pumps to grow within the macrophages and how this has then led us to understand a little bit about drug tolerance. And in the last few minutes, I want to tell you how we've come to understand how it ruptures out of the granuloma because that is a critical step in transmission. If you don't have a necrotic granuloma, no matter how infected you are, you don't really transmit very well. So it would be a dead end for the organism without this last step. This understanding again came by serendipity from David Tobin, who ha now has his own lab at uh, Duke University. And at the time, Cecilia Mons was doing a, a forward genetic screen for looking at determinants of uh, facial motor neuron migration. She's a neurobiologist. And we piggybacked on the screen to see if the fish could tell us what made it more susceptible and resistant to infection. So we would simply take her fish, her mutant fish. We knew, we didn't know what the mutation was, and we would screen them phenotypically. And so here is a wild type fish, and here is a mutant fish. And this mutant, I don't need to emphasize, is highly infected as compared to its wild type sibling. So when, when, um, when David mapped the mutation, my heart sank because it was in the arachidonic acid pathway, something that I had sort of muddled through in medical school and only remembered at this stage that it had something to do with aspirin and as asthma. And turns out that the mutant, that the, the fish was mutant in the leukotriene A4 hydrolase, an enzyme that converts the, an unstable epoxide leukotriene A4 into a highly stable pro-inflammatory molecule leukotriene B4. Now, you would think that the absence of this, which led to the absence of a pro-inflammatory molecule, was the reason why the fish succumbed to TB. But in fact, it turns out that we don't need leukotriene B4 to protect us against TB. Against many other things, yes, but against TB, no. And it turns out that the reason that these fish were susceptible was because this unstable molecule was being channeled into the production of an anti-inflammatory molecule called lipoxin A4 that now had a dominant anti-inflammatory, created a dominant anti-inflammatory milieu so that the host simply couldn't mount a, a, an appropriate response to TB. And so in a nutshell, if you had what David showed was if you don't make enough of this enzyme, you make these anti-inflammatory lipoxins, and you don't mount a key inflammatory molecule, which is TNF. And because of that, you get uncontrolled mycobacterial growth. But when he probed this further, he had a surprise, because he found that if you had too much of the enzyme and made too much of the pro-inflammatory molecule, you again had the same uncontrolled bacterial growth, which didn't make any sense because why should inflammation be bad? And he showed that that was mediated by having too much TNF. So what could be going on? But before we probe what's going on, we realized that this was all done in fish eggs and we needed to have some relevance. And so David searched the 1,000 Genomes project had just matured, and David was able to find that the, there was a polymorphism in the human LTA4H promoter, a C to T transition, and he was able to show that it, this transition was functional in that it mediated levels of LTA4H. So it was the causal variant that was a common causal variant. And in a nutshell, before I show you the data, we found in a human clinical study that it regulated TB severity in exactly the way predicted by the fish. Too little and too much both caused severe TB, whereas the middle 
was the one that caused the least severe TB. So let's have a look at the data. Here's the polymorphism. Here is the level of protein in relation to the polymorphism. The CCs make the least, the TTs make the most, and the heterozygotes are in the middle. This is all people. We've switched to people now. The, the cohort we looked at this in is TB meningitis. TB meningitis is a very severe, the severest form of TB, and in the best hands, as, in, as, was, as is the case at the Wellcome Trust unit in Vietnam, it carries a mortality of about 20%, but more like more in normal places, average places, about 40%. And this is drug-sensitive TB with full treatment. So if David is right, then what would you predict? You would predict that the people who would live would be the people who have the, head, the heterozygotes should survive, and both homozygotes should do badly. And that's exactly what David found. Heterozygotes live, and the highs and the lows both do well. But the, but the implications of this go directly to treatment, and this is because of the following. Because TB meningitis is such a severe disease and because you see all that gooey stuff at the base of the brain that suggests a whole lot of inflammation, people have in a hand-waving way used potent anti-inflammatory treatment as an, as an adjuvant to antibiotic treatment. And they've used dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid and a broadly immunosuppressive glucocorticoid. And we've used this for ages in my medical college already and that, I'm, you know, that was ancient times. We were already using it. But this study that was done in Vietnam by Guy Thwaites made it the standard of care because he showed in a placebo-controlled, double-blinded study that dexamethasone showed a slight improvement. And yes, this is very slight, but we don't have anything else. So this is now standard of care treatment. You are not allowed to use your judgment anymore. You just use it. And so David made the prediction that this small improvement was because the low inflammatory group is going to be hurt by the steroids and only the high inflammatory group is going to be helped by immuno anti-inflammatory treatment. So he was able to look at this in this historical cohort. So let's have a look ourselves. High, without dexamethasone, dying a lot, close to 40%. And in this admittedly small cohort, there's not a single death with dexamethasone. But look at the lows. They're actually being harmed by the treatment. And so, um, so to summarize this part, this, we started off with a screen with the fish that the fish come from the holy waters of the Ganges. And I like to say that's why they're so clear. And then we went to Vietnam and we uh, found that our mutant was relevant there. And then we actually looked at a cohort of leprosy patients in Nepal and again showed that the variant associated with leprosy with both homozygotes giving you severe leprosy and the heterozygotes being protected. And um, this is Guy Thwaites and this was all done at the Wellcome Trust with uh, a bunch of uh, very helpful people. And the leprosy work was done with Diana who ran the Anandban Mission Hospital. And Mary Claire King was a human geneticist who was interested in breast cancer and schizophrenia, and we am happy to say we've roped her into TB, and she was very helpful. So because we're scientists, so we now know that we should only treat the people who have the high condition with steroids. And in fact, that has just been verified in a repeat study, and now there's a trial going on to to do this in a prospective manner and show that dexamethasone is actually harming those with the low inflammatory genotype. So all that's on the on route. But the puzzle is why does the high inflammatory state, why is it bad for you if you have TB? Because evolutionarily you would predict that inflammation is good for infection and bad for modern day conditions like heart disease and arthritis and so on. But here we are saying that's not so simple. It's bad for infection too in, in, in excessive amounts. And Fran, who was a postdoc in the lab and who's now been recruited as a faculty to Cambridge, um, figured this out. So if 
you have optimal levels of TNF, then you just grow by intracellular, sp intercellular spread in the granuloma, and that's not so great for you, but it's not terrible. And if you have too little TNF, then what happens is the bug, the cell cannot control the bacteria. And so the bacterium overgrows and the cell ruptures. And that's even worse because extracellularly the bacteria have, n have nothing, no, the host has no defenses against extracellular bacteria. And so they really grow like gangbusters in that casium I showed you. But what about in the high TNF state? What Fran found was that initially the macrophage controls the bug even better. And yet, suddenly, the macrophage pops open, and the few bacteria that get released rapidly catch up and they grow. So why is that? And so here is the, the bare elements of the pathway that he figured out. If you make too much TNF because you make too much of the leukotriene B4, when you bind your receptor in, in this sort of excess, then you trigger a bunch of kinases, RIP1, RIP3, and then a bunch of other proteins that cause the mitochondrion to make a lot of reactive oxygen. This is good at first because the reactive oxygen diffuses out and kills the bacteria. But then the reactive oxygen triggers the translocation of a redox-sensitive matrix mitochondrial protein called cyclophilin D to come from the matrix to the membrane where it participates in the formation of the mitochondrial pore complex. And this causes the leakage of voltage potential and the cell is kaput, its membranes lice open, and the bacteria are released. And he found that it, had not, it didn't do it by just one mechanism, but by two, because the reactive oxygen also triggers, goes, diffuses out, and triggers acid sphingomyelinase in the lysosome to overproduce a lipid called ceramide that comes in and by a mechanism that he's now fully identified, causes, part, helps the cyclophilin D to burst open the mitochondrion. And this then would, you would make the prediction, so Fran made the prediction that if you interrupted this process downstream of reactive oxygen, you would get the benefit of the reactive oxygen and be able to kill the bacteria without killing the cells, right? Because it's essentially a race. You're, you're in the process by the reactive oxygen of killing the bacteria when you, go, when you pop open and now the bacteria come out and the game's over for the host. And so he, he made that prediction and he was able to test that genetically and it came true, the prediction, but then he went and found two drugs. One is alisporavir, that is a drug in clinical, that was discovered for mitochondrial uh, muscular dystrophies and is in, being, is in clinical trials for hepatitis C. And another is a very old antidepressant called disipramine that targets this pathway. And he was able to show that by using these two drugs that he was now able to take the bad genotype of TB and make it better. You're better off having this genotype if, because now you have drugs to, to treat it. And it, there's an analogy for this in, in the cancer world because now, you know, for example, if you have breast cancer that's um, um, EGF positive, HER2 new positive, you're almost better off than if you have one that is triple negative because we've got drugs to treat these. And this is coming true in a bunch of cancers now where in, an aggressive cancer is now better, you're better off with it. Okay. So the very last thing I want to tell you is that we've now come up, we had come up with a lot of cures for the high end, high TNF. We've got disipramine. We already had steroids, which was giving you 100% cure. And we now had disipramine and alisporavir. But what about the population that has the low LTA4H, which is actually slightly the majority? You know, it's a 60, it's a 70-30 distribution, at least in Asia, in Asia. So what about them? And so we were racking our brains, and we realized that if you went upstream and inhibited 5-lipoxygenase with a well-known drug used for asthma called Xyluton, that you would block lipoxin and LTB4, and we don't need either of them to fight TB. And so when we do that, 
we can show that the low, this is wild type, this is the low state, which is hyper susceptible, and if you give these animals xyluton, then you can bring them down. And this is something else that the Wellcome Trust is willing to try. And again, xyluton is something that concentrates and does very well in the lung because asthma is a disease of the lung, so it will be particularly advantageous for us to try this, for example, in pulmonary TB. Okay, so I've shown you for the last bit, I've shown you a whole bunch of pathways, and if you're like me, you've forgotten all of them, so I'm going to give you a punchline message, and this is, um, so this is not the Ganges River. Do you know what river this might be? This is the Boiling River in Yellowstone National Park, and it's on the Montana-Wyoming border, and if you've had a hot day's hiking in, in Yellowstone, you want to go and, and take a bath in this river. And in the old days, they didn't allow it, but people used to sneak in anyway, so they finally made an entrance. And so you kind of have to walk all this way about half a kilometer or so before you get in. And as you walk along, you can't help but notice that everybody's in a straight line in the river. And you enter the river and you can really see it. You've entered about here and you can really see it. There's a couple of kids that wander out a bit, but everybody's sitting here, and why might that be? Too hot. So this is a mount, a cold river um, fed by a hot spring. So if you step here, it's 95 degrees and more. And if you step here, it's way too cold. And so I would, I would argue that TB is a disease of being just right. And if you're genetically just right, then you don't need our help because you sort of you can muddle through with your with antibiotics. But if you're not and if you're, if you're too hot, then you get steroids, and we can correct you pharmacologically with steroids and now with all these other drugs. And we didn't have anything for the too cold, but we finally have xyluton that we're going to try. And so that's the message of the last part. And then just coming back, I've, I think I've shown you that using these little larvae, we've come up with, with things that might be relevant to human TB, starting with how infection begins, how the bacteria expand in granulomas, and how that leads us to um, understand a little bit about drug tolerance, how they exploit the granuloma to first spread within cells, and then how under cert certain circumstances of host, gene host genetics, they are more prone to rupture out of the granuloma, which is required for their final transmission. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a little more about the efflux pump in uh, my, uh, the tuberculosis that seems to have an effect both on antibiotics and on the survival mm -hmm. of it? Yes. It's in the, the, the specific one for, so we know that every single antibiotic we've tested, and we've tested most of the TB antibiotics, practically all of them, uh, first line, second line, third line drugs, they all have macrophage induced efflux, including uh, linazolid, which is the the one that Cliff Barry has been promoting uh, quite effectively over here. Linazolid is also uh, has efflux. We've identified the pumps for two of them, for rifampicin and moxifloxacin. The pumps for rifampicin are actually, there are two pumps, uh, each of which is required to mediate tolerance, so we suspect they work together. Uh, the first is a multi, an MFS pump. It's a, it's a, and, and it's, it's of the MFS family. It's called 1258C, but that doesn't mean anything. And the other is an arsenate transporter, uh, RSB. It's an RSB. And, um, well, that's, and, and, and what's really interesting is that these, these pumps only mediate rifampicin tolerance. Rifampicin is one of the biggest antibiotics and is hydrophobic. And you would think, 
that it would pump out things like isoniazid, which is this little hydrophilic molecule, but it doesn't. So removing this pump completely preserves isoniazid tolerance, but removes rifampicin tolerance. But we chose, but verapamil removes both. So verapamil somehow acting on both the rifampicin pump, which we know, and the isoniazid pump, which we haven't yet identified. For the persistence phenomenon, not antibiotic resistance, do you know what the substrates are for the pumps? <laughs> the real substrates, you mean, other than the antibiotics? No, we don't. And because, because the rifampicin pump takes away, um, uh, is the one that, that is also required for growth in the macrophage, we're wondering if it's something like an antimicrobial peptide, which is hydrophobic, you know. So could that be? But we know nothing. We don't know what the endogenous signal is, and we don't know what the endogenous substrate is. But you know, if you think about it a little bit, uh, as I did many months after discovering all this, it's you know, if you go back and look at all the gene, uh, the, the the species in the Mycobacterium genus, they all have these efflux pumps, including 1258C. It's not a pathogen-specific pump. It's there in all the soil in that soil-dwelling one as well. And so you kind of wonder if it was initially there to, you know, for interbacterial warfare or interorganismal warfare for anti, you know, for, for antimicrobial agents, got repurposed to uh, allow it to grow when it entered a eukaryotic cell, and then in the modern day has been repurposed yet again, well, has, been, has gone back to its ancestral purpose, you know. So, but we would, we would love to find the natural substrates. And, and one of the things we're doing, in, it turns out that Ben Luisi, who's one of the world experts in solving the structures of, of bacterial transporters, is in Cambridge and is very happy to help us with this. So uh, he's now tackling this pump. And we're hoping that if we can even get some protein, let alone a structure, that we can start to ask some questions about the substrate. So we're really actively working on it now with more. Yes. Uh, many years ago, I worked at the great privilege of working on the uh, Tex-Mex border, and I treated many cases of tuberculosis. And I found that all the drug-sensitive ones, you're, you were talking about how difficult it is. Uh, the system that we had in place with Salubridad and Asistencia de Mexico was excellent, and we, they have special nurses trained for that. Mm -hmm. and I'm talking about 30 years yep. ago. They, we would go out there, we yep. used uh, INH, yep. rifampin, and ethambutol. In some cases, we'd use streptomycin as the fourth drug. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can't say I saw a billion cases, but I saw them in, in, on the coast of Tamaulipas, and I saw on the Tex-Mex border con Tamaulipas with uh, Roma, Texas. And I honestly saw some very dramatic cures very rapidly yep. with scrofulosis. Mm -hmm. I've seen everything. So I think that that's kind of unfounded. I think in India, perhaps, you have a, a group, and I'm not trying to be presumptuous that just they don't they they don't get the drugs distributed properly they don't give them properly or whatever or in Vietnam also because it's difficult for me to believe that many years ago that we were able to be that effective and that good and these other countries can't if they have the proper medicine and they know how to I think apply you've it. hit the nail on the head I mean the India TB control program in India is a disaster and it's that is true for all the world where where there is TB but the bottom line is look if you've if any, I mean, let's be honest, if you've been prescribed antibiotics for 10 days even, how many of you can tell me that you've never missed a dose? You know, and we are privileged people. Um, if you have directly observed therapy and you have nurses to go out there and, ta and, and chase after people, yes, you can get treatment. I mean, my mother had, you know, TB and eventually she got cured when, when rifampicin came into the, came into being, but it's, it's not easy. And it's, I mean, it's, TB is a social problem. In fact, if we didn't have poverty, then I'd be out of business. Um, yeah, maybe we can take this discussion to yeah. a reception. Okay. Actually, I've been told we need to Thank cut you. off for timing. Um, but there will be a reception in the library co-sponsored or oh. sponsored by the partner. Um, FAES, but I just want to end by thanking you for such Thank a stimulating, you. interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.